Cruise me in the morning, last thing at night. Welcome back to Chapter 6 of the Hardy Book, Zachary McDonald. Don't know why, just don't know fucking why, man. But I feel it's a good time to throw in an old story into the mix. So here we go, Climpipe McGonagall. Legend has it around town, one of Buzz McDonald's ancestors, going way, way, way back, was one of the first settlers on Plymouth Colony out in the USA. His name was Zachary McDonald, a rowdy man with noble enough intentions. He had a strong and powerful nose for the sauce. So much so, in fact, that he started his own lucrative brewing and distribution business. McDonald became something of a mercantile. Big man walking down Main Street. Things were going very well for Zack. His pockets were nicely lined with gold and silver. Ooh. He began employing staff to do the legwork. Gavigan. Unlike most big shot businessmen on BBC's Dragon's Touch, he didn't sit back and oversee the management of his empire. He got stuck right into the brewing process. The sourcing of primo grains and spring ishka from the mythical waterfalls of Glencar and Leitrim. Just up the road from Schneigotown. He was a pure renaissance man. The pride he took in his lush production was mesmerizing. He'd have a few things to say about proper 12 whiskey, so he would. Apparently it's only one-year-old bush mills. I often hear lofty whiskey sauce hounds aren't happy about it one bit. I was talking to Sinn Féin Lundy about it in Tezzy's the last day. Bushmills is a Protestant distillery. Truth be told, I wouldn't give a fuck about what I was drinking, as long as it was palatable and gets the job done. I'll quaff it, man. Even if it was made by Francis Higgins himself. Actually, fuck that. I'd only be paying for the rod that whips my own arse. Look at the moral of the story was Zack being a man of solid, self-made prosperity, possessed a sound business mind, great battering skills, with pure dedication to customer satisfaction. He enjoyed a nice few solid years of good times, red meat off the bone in the best of taverns, cavorting with the finest of maidens. Lovely, athletic finers, bodies on them like river dancers, smooth, strong, toned legs, sweet thigh gaps and badonka donks. Oh, he would have been decked out in the smoothest cotton silks of the Orient, splashed then with the finest, muskiest Middle Eastern oils available. He was wandering around with the chest out, like Callum Best after the hair transplants. Our Zack was big man on Love Island. It wasn't long until he drew attention to himself for being a wealthy merchant. This being Ireland, the land of jealousy and intrigue and coveting eyes, caused many's a feather to be ruffled by Zack's flamboyant carry-on. One fateful evening, Zack felt the winds of fortune change. The winds of fortune decided it would be taking a spin down south in a 1998 Nissan Almira. The hand of fate had shown him the front door of the crack house, a forced exodus that ejected him from his much beloved homeland. In order to avoid persecution at the hand of one of history's most ultimate dry bastards, Oliver Cromwell. That warty old bollocks caused an awful lot of misery around Ireland, much of the UK too. It was the mid 1600s. Once again, our tiny island home was besieged, this time by a conquest of bad boys, a bloody puritanical commitment of turning era into a steamboat plantation for English cruel dudes. Whatever that means, I have no idea, but it sounded good at the time. Now, this could be total utter pub talk, as it was Buzz's dad himself who claimed these events to be true. He told us to crack one night down in Dunkreeby's bar and grill, he was caught in the mist of consuming nine Jaeger bombs, 15 pints of stout and 16 shots of Baileys. 
he was in peak Blarney condition for telling such epic tales of trial and tribulation and Zack's eventual triumph over adversity. It was post-English Civil War at the time when Zachary MacDonald found himself caught up in the most precarious situation. There would have been no other option than to skedaddle. Not to mention, deep down, he'd enough of the lashing rain and those bothersome roundheads constantly pissing on the bonfire. Bully boys going around persecuting the vanquished cavaliers and their Irish counterparts, liquidating their estates after an 11 year war of the three kingdoms between the roundheads and the cavaliers. These two groups have often been used as a euphemism to describe male circumcision on account of their appearance. If your bell was peeled back permanently, you'd be regarded as a roundhead. If you kept hold of the foreskin on the other hand, you're a cavalier. Penile dermal coverage aside, the two parties wore vastly different outfits. The roundheads were dressed like plain Janes, wearing boring postmodernistic outfits. Greys, blacks and brown, with big white collars. Concurrently, the cavaliers were flashy cool dudes, with curly long hair like Robert Plant, plenty of bright loud colours, pearl earrings, with long feathers on their hats. They were generally classed with the women and loved a good old session. The roundheads were commonly perceived as being boring and depressing, essentially player haters. Comparatively speaking, it was like early 80s Joy Division versus Led Zeppelin, Madison Square Garden era. The battle between the puritanical parliamentarians, roundheads, and the royalists, Catholic and Anglican cavaliers, loyal to King Charles I. I'd say King Charles must have been sound, because they named a lovely little breed of dog after him. You know, the cosy little lads with floppy ears and big brown eyes. Fluffy paws. You know the ones I'm talking about. King Charles Cavaliers like. The beef all started after Charles maintained he had God-given rights as king to raise taxes, probably enjoying the crack a little bit too much and began to fall behind with the national rent. The puritanical boys, led by Cromwell, were getting really miffed. They didn't take kindly to the flashy, big pimping ways of the Cavaliers. The new model army was created in order to count their discontent through hard fighting. What followed was three civil wars across the UK, Scotland and Irish territories. Unfortunately for the Cavaliers and the Irish, the Roundheads won, stripping titles of defeated nobles and their subordinate constituents. Monumental financial restitutions were paid out to the victors after the war. Land and assets were stripped from royalist nobility. This ensured that Cromwell and his cohorts gained full control. During these wars, the joint royalist forces, along with the Irish Confederacy, under the Duke of Ormond, tried to secure Dublin. And I'm not talking about Brian Ormond. Brian Ormond. Oh. The Irish forces planned on laying siege to the parliamentarians in Rath Mines, but they were a pure no-show. Cromwell's men won against a larger force which led to the capture of Dublin. He was then able to land 15,000 nutters unimpeded into Dublin. Following this, many allegiances were forged and broken. There was treachery and valour afoot, massacre and bloodshed, most notably the siege of Drogheda that saw 3,000 Irish civilians slain by the new model army. Then came the Battle of Ben Burb, led by the outstanding military general Owen Roe O'Neill, a descendant of the famous Ulster dynasty based up in Tyrone. O'Neill had spent most of his early life as an exile abroad in the Spanish-held Netherlands. That was way back in the day when Spain was a big deal. He fought in the Spanish army before heading back home to sort out the Scottish Covenanters. Moody Scottish Puritans that wanted their own slice of the Irish pie. In layman's terms, the country was a total mess. Like a house in Ballyban, Galway, rented out to a gang of GMIT students. Kill! <laughs> For the above reasons, and more to come, Zach said, Fuck this place! Fucking cops! Before bailing to the undiscovered country to make handy money, opening the world's first Irish pub in the States. 
Zach was the first man in history to cash in on this lucrative painting concept. Plymouth Rock yeah. was the one place that badly needed a hard bit of lushing. Named after a town in Devon, located in contemporary Massachusetts. Boston. There's a big old stone left in the middle of the beach. Plymouth Rock job. The Puritans had parked the Mayflower nearby and tied her up so she wouldn't get nicked by opportunistic would-be seafaring joyriders. Creamfields, cons. There was zero crack to be found here. It would be like being stuck in a perpetual episode of the Antiques Roadshow. Dirty BBC show. Life was tough for those first puritanical settlers. Was it, yeah? Not just because they'd landed in a remote, undeveloped part of the eastern seaboard, nor was it because of all the dowdy, boring pricks wearing weird top hats. Hats that looked like those black traffic cones Irish undertakers used for marking the roads outside rural funeral parlours during a wake. I know them well, yeah. By cordoning off a section of the road, preventing further grief, stopping condolence merchants from getting quantum boshed by passing traffic. Oh, fuck! Imagine being at sea for months, stuck on a vessel named after a style of seafood sauce. Then you have to build a load of houses and get stuck into planting spuds and carrots. Life was hard, cold, wet, and boring as fuck. The only escape was a few fizzy amber lutioners to take the edge right off. <sighs> Not a soul among their ranks were able to manufacture putcheen and toasty grain pints on the level MacDonald could. Fair balls to Zakin. He could knock up top-notch alcohol out of any old shite. Rolling Keaton job. Potato skins were as his speciality. After all, it was privateer seafaring mercenary Sir Francis Drake. Or was it Walter Raleigh? Who gives a Who fuck? cares? Whoever it was, he'd recently brought spuds to Europe after robbing them from the Spanish Armada during a massive scrap out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Cheeky little prick had taken credit for the liberation of the spud. I often wonder what the hell lads were eating before the arrival of the much adored spud. Make you wonder. It doesn't bear thinking about. No. Imagine. There'd be no crisps. No. No curry cheese chips. No. No mash. Bastards. No roasties. Cunts. Or no creamy garlic gratin. Bastards. They talk about the invention of the wheel. Yeah. Penicillin. Oh. And the internet. Got that one right. But come on to fuck, man. Oh, yeah. What kind of world would it be without praties? Irish mammies. Saying that, though, spuds and sugar were never part of the European diet until the 1500s. Cunts. They were introduced to Ireland in 1589. Were they, yeah? In fact, they were so popular and nutritious that they were planted in over 40,000 acres down in town in Cork. Wikipedia, yeah. They grew like wildfire. Oh, class. It's believed that the Incan tough cunts of Peru were the first to plant potatoes around 8,000 BC to 5,000 BC. Apocalypto. In 1536, a bunch of ruthlessly hard men Crunch. with cool moustaches and body armour called Spanish conquistadors Ooh. conquered the shit out of Peru thus liberating the potato before carrying them back off to Europe on their big fat power galleons. Oh. Potatoes contained most vitamins needed for sustenance. They could be provided to nearly 10 people for each acre of land cultivated. Fucking class. Sound job mom. Spark up the deep fat fryer and work away. Eddie Rockets, yeah? Fucking, fucking, fucking. I can smell it now. The greasy scent of 19's council estate kitchens mixed with cigarette smoke. Such a smell would be glued to kids' uniforms in school. The stink man. Your old lady's poor. Ha 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 ha. Oh, the stink. These days, thanks to modern agriculture, and advanced supply lines, food appears to be plentiful. No thanks to the billionaire class who fucking hate us and want us to perish while we pay tax to slowly depopulate ourselves. Living in VR pods, eating beetle larva, wanking our lives away to anime. How dare you? But I digress. Dietitians say if you want to have a chiseled body like Christine Hemsworth, we should all have low-carb diets to keep the weight off. Well, that's all well and good, considering we now live sedimentary lifestyles these days. Machines do most of the heavy lifting. It's rare for the average Westerner to do. The same kind of graft they would be doing in the olden days. That's why we go to gyms. Steroids are class. 
where we lift and push things. Gains. Expending excess energy to work off excess calories. Protein. Wellness. My grandfather would have cut an entire field of grass by hand in a single day. He ate nothing but boiled eggs and stew. Lies. He would have been fucking jacked, man. Six pack. Solid pecs. Arms like hydraulic rams. Swoo. But nobody would have known any different. Because he would have just had a suit jacket on him. Instead of taking photos of his torso in the mirror and sharing it online to boost his own ego and secure sexual activity from erotic online followers. Look at my fucking six pack. He would have had a grandfather shirt on him before he was even a grandfather. On a side note, it's funny to see when you look back at old pictures from owl lads from bygone days or reenactments of such times, most notably Peaky Blinders. A show about brummy hardman gangsters from the post Great War Birmingham. All right, all right, all right. Everyone looked well dressed. Even poor lads wore suits and ties. Thanks to Peaky, Peaky blinders. blinders, half the young bucks in Ireland had haircuts like fresh loaves of bread. I was a bit daft to be fair, like playing Arctic monkeys to scenes based in the 1920s. <laughs> Alright, we tried this white powder. It's called cocaine. <laughs> Aiden Gillen. Aiden Gillen got the touch out of it. He's in fucking everything, man. Little eyes on him, like a crab. Started off in Queer as Folk on Channel 4, shifting lads and getting blowers. Then he went on to do The Wire. After that, then, RTE just said, Here, Aido, hey, do you want to be in another drama series? RTE drama. Hahi, Dave Allen. Other voices. Whatever the fuck, man. He can do no wrong. And he would have said, Yes, yeah, sound. Plenty of coin. I'm going building a nice extension on my own gaff in San Anton Ski Resort. That'll do nicely. Extender. Soft money. Gives a few quid there, good lad. Like I was saying, at the turn of the 20th century, even dodgy scummers and paupers had a bit of style to them back then. Bastards. No one's asked me for a hey, cobblers. Nowadays, dodgy boys wear tracksuits and football tops. Mass-produced synthetic nylon, polyester fabrics and Nike Air Max. Sports Direct. It's the closest thing to wearing pyjamas you can get. Foot Locker. These kind of pants are very accommodating while running away from crime scenes and hopping over garden fences after robbing a PlayStation 5 and silverware from a house. We've taken everything. Adults that wear such garments outside of athletic leisurely pursuits can be seen in high street retail areas, bus stations, and most of Dublin. Ah, here now. Heroin addicts especially gravitate towards this trend. Windbreakers, Adidas pants, and Scottish Premier League jerseys. Depending on if you're a Tig or a Hun, aka Celtic or Rangers. <laughs> hey, come to think of it, that sounds exactly like how my best friend Buzz McDonald dresses. Shit, man. Am I hanging out with a scummer? But he's sound, though. It's not his fault. He never did well in school. Enough about tracksuits and Aiden Gillen. Oh, I want to hear more about him. Back to Spuds and Sugar. Why sugar, you ask? Didn't ask anything. Well, that was new to the European paleo diet as well. They say sugar is shocking bad for you. It leads to all kinds of ailments. Candida, cancer, diabetes and shite teeth. Here's another fact for you. By God, old Durkin's about to drop some more sweet knowledge bombs on y'all maz. Biatch. Sugar was only discovered by Western Europeans as a result of the Crusades. In the 11th century AD, and the first touch of sugar was recorded in England in 1069. The subsequent centuries saw a major expansion of Western European trade with the East, including the importation of sugar. I read once in the National Geographic magazine Ooh, college boy. that during Renaissance time, the average person in Europe ate the equivalent of a cube of sugar each week. Did they though? Can you imagine the shape people were in back then, man? Oh, class. Buff as fuck. Massive. Pure lean. But then again, Tangle Twister ice lollies are nice. Oh, fact. While on the subject of spuds and maritime exploration, don't quote me on this, Go on. but I heard this from Tommy Bugenhagen, who's class at history, mm. that Francis Drake 
was one of the only lads in history to have ever smashed Queen Elizabeth I's back doors in. What? If only she got a little bit more of that carry-on, the world as we know it would have been a much different place today. Oh. We wouldn't be here now reading and writing this excuse for a book. That's right. As the time permutations would have had a massive global knock-on effect on the following chronological events. So it was all luck, I suppose. Ashton cut your job. Or was it? I guess we'll never know. I leave that one up to Marty McFly, Dr. Phil, and their flying DeLorean Goldwing. Sure, just look at who Elizabeth I's owl ad was. Bloated, pie-eating womanizer, bell-cheddar king Henry VIII, a cranky fat cunt of the highest order. Smell shy. Sure, what woman would have had him? Smell of biscuits. He was the poster boy for domestic abuse, that lad. A wrong guy. Imagine if the Vatican had just let him have the divorce with Catherine of Aragon, instead of being stubborn, pious bastards. My Uncle Mick used to tell me, Standing prick has no conscience, and he'd be dead right. As French Toast O'Toole would say, Hard in the cock, soft in the head. That's a fact. Many a conflict was starting over a man wanting to blow the beans at any cost, or other men simply being player haters. Nothing worse than a player hater. Twitter's full of them, hey. Pasty faced lads with soft little hands, communicating to each other on Reddit boards and slogans such as, Ah, lads, and careful now. Fuck off. Reddit Ireland. I dry humped a lot of you in a display of canine hierarchical dominance. Dog rough, man. Either way, who knew history was this exciting? It's like a never-ending episode of EastEnders. Oi! Only you have to use your imagination to picture the action. Plus, we don't really know the full story of each individual historical event. No. Things would have played out much differently to what we've been told. Consider how many times your average Instagram model poses for one picture she posts. Bastards. Dozens if not hundreds of attempts to find the right angle in the unflattering front camera. The world is fucked. I fucking hate looking at myself in that front camera, man. Face on me like Mickey Hucknell after a dangerously long weekend on Inches Cider while boshing cheap Billy Whiz up the nostrils in a Blackpool bedsit. Stink dog. Or worse yet, Gerard Depeju on steroids. Not cool steroids either. The kind they give people with Crohn's disease. Fuck's sake. In any case... It makes sense that most of our true history has been written by the victor. Yeah. And much of it has been erased from public consciousness. Got that one right. So what can you do about it now, like? Nothing, man. Oh, I've gone off on yet another tangent. Yes. Tangents within tangents. Death bastard. Like an onion of tangents. Christopher Nolan should make a blockbuster film about me. Christopher Nolan? Featuring Killian Murphy and call it Tangent. That man. Sure, look it. You're well used to it at this stage, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Straight. Also, I've been rewriting this chapter for nine months, man. Ten now. So, back to Plymouth Colony. Yeah, I heard it was a total disaster before McDonald turned up with his copper worm and still, producing sweet barrels of Zach's hard lemonade. Ooh. It refreshed the mouths of sun-kissed labourers in the heat of the summer sun. Everyone was forced to work the land, throwing all their produce into the common lot. This disincentivized harder work and farmers from yielding more crops. How do you know were you there? They were sick of breaking their balls, toiling in the fields, while Johnny Appleseed and the boys rough smoking sweet kind bud with the natives. <sniffs> they did away with the common lock crack and let people buy and sell their own produce. Freedom. Leaving the likes of Zack free to brew up sweet plonk. Mm. It wasn't too long after he opened up the first Irish pub called Cromwell's Arse, Cunts. which was a big hit with the locals. According to Buzz's Owlad, Zachary wandered down to Cork, planting spuds. Did he? A few of the monks had shown him how to make whiskey. Funky monks. That's when he came up with the idea of using potato skins, used for creating putching. Class. And the lads were steamboat willied. 24-7. 24 never, never begging, begging for, for a rain check. Whatever that means, I've no fucking clue. Again, it was some shite I learned from Limp Biscuit frontman, Freddie Dursht. Zachy baby, started selling drink in bulk to soldiers, merchants and townsfolk up and down the land of Erin, employing a team of loyal henchmen to start running supply lines. Caravans of oxes carrying booze from one town to the next. Like the crack you'd be at in Fallout 4 in the radioactive wastelands of Boston. Bostonians. Lucky for these boys, there was no death claws, feral ghouls or mirelurks knocking about. Stingwing. Before leaving Ireland, Zack had built up a nice little sauce empire for himself, until one fateful encounter. Zack was stopping by the town of Clanmel, 
Tipperary to pick up sweet tips on making apple cider. Lovely, crispy, cool pints of Clonmel champagne. Or for those of you not privy to the amber quarry known as Bulmers or Magners if you're outside of Ireland. After the siege of Clonmel, MacDonald knew it was time to make like a pair of Penny's jeans and split. Wasn't long until he crossed paths with some spiteful bastard ready to drop trowel on his picnic. A high-ranking general in the new model army named Lord Robert Ramsbottom. He was top brass in Cromwell's service. He and his men had just returned from a botched siege of Clonmel Town. Cudgels. Cromwell himself was waiting with his battalions to the north. The boys in tip were handy with the steel under the new guidance of Hugh Dove O'Neill, Owen Rowe's nephew. He too was a true tough guy. Big man. An expert in siege warfare and defence. They killed over a thousand of Cromwell's men as they breached the north walls. They were bottlenecked, blasted and stabbed by O'Neill's men on the inside. Killed to death. Shot from both sides of the defence with chain shots. Scary. Basically two cannonballs tied together with a chain originally designed for nautical warfare, Teabagging. used for blasting sails and masts, incredibly devastating over short to medium range. Terrible. They were literally cutting lads in half, Fucking history channel job. piling up on one another. In military terms, this gruesome trap would be known as a killing field, the last place a man would want to find himself in, hey. Who are you, a fucking general, is it? It was to be Cromwell's largest defeat in all of his military campaigns. As the sun began to set, he knew it was folly to continue the assault until the heavy artillery had arrived. Hard folly. If O'Neill had been given more support, he may well have defeated Cromwell altogether. If my auntie had balls, she'd be called Steve. Hugh O'Neill was a cute bastard, to be fair to him. Cute as a pet fox. He sent the mayor to go out and ratify a peace declaration to spare the inhabitants from bloodshed. As he did this, Dove O'Neill and the boys bailed south over the bridge and headed straight to Waterford to fight another day. Go on the boys. Bailing Clan Mel on a mega high from victory, they stopped upon Zachary and his band of sauce wagons. Hugh called Zach. Tar -tar 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 -tar. Give us a couple of those there barrels, will you? No bother, horse box. Dust my claw with wedge, kind sir, and I'll strap them to the bindings of your mythical beasts of burden. And with that, O'Neill gave Zach the sweetest touch of coin thanked him tenderly for bounding off for the bright lights of Waterford Town. Cheers for that there, big man. Take a handy. Tell those roundhead wankers pure nothing, hey. Fair balls to you, Hugh. You're a sound bastard. Good luck and good bless, lovely laddine. Chuck your lorty. And off they blistered, hooves tearing up the mud as they thundered away off over the horizon. Later on, upon the meeting of Ramsbottom, the crack with Zack went downhill fast. The general arbitrarily demanded MacDonald hand over a lump sum of unpaid tax, claiming he owed it to Cromwell for all the sweet claw wedge he'd earned cash in hand, cash. selling lovely lush to a diverse range of folks that lived around the towns and that. Medieval dossers. Pissheads. Such a turn of events were mondo misery to the max, a regular expression used by orange cowled hero in a half shell, Michelangelo. The party dude from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. My favourite one out of all the lean green fighting machine. Zack was a charismatic purveyor of looseners, looseners and it was well known he was a wily bastard. He knew how to handle such a gaggle of puritanical dry shites. There'd be no handy numbers or quarter given from such stern overlords here. No crack whatsoever. He said, sure look at Colonel Ram's crack. I quenched the mouths of the working man after his hard day's graft. It's my vocation. I do what I must. Sure, it's God's work I'm doing, your dryness. Go on, have a few drinks. Ramsbottom gazed at him with a scowl, eased his discontent momentarily. Lighten up to fuck. It was then Zachary noticed the general had broken red blood vessels across the bridge of his nose. Drinking it up. He was indeed a secret lemonade drinker. Oh no. I'm a man of simple means. Despite what those jealous pricks around town might have been saying about me. Begrudgers. They might have remarked about how well I was doing for myself. I assure you, 
All liquid assets are tied up in my stock. You tell him that. I can offer you and your men as much quality porters and ales as you can carry. Or oh, the finest. It would be a welcome respite after your heavy losses taken back the road there in Clonmel. Yourself and the boys could do with a drop to loosen Share up. Share the load. And to yourself, General. I have a lovely bottling of whiskey, mm. brewed by holy men, the funky monks of Loch Ree. Oh, those boys. General Ramsbottom dismounted the horse and took for himself a flagon of the finest whiskey, and to his men, mm. several barrels of ale. Zachary was allowed to go on his way freely, good lad, Zach. to which he made a hasty exit, for he had damn good reason to leave in a hurry. He had just palmed off a load of stale sauce that he Ugh. planned on selling to a bunch of hard squatters. Shams. Rough living nutters holed up in Temple Moor. A hardy bunch of strong lads Headers. who'd set up a sweet DOS palace come nightclub. Pissheads. These lads were immune to stale beer, Rough unlike living. Ramsbottom and his men, Soft cuts. who had the Guinness shites after consuming Zack's rancid plonk later that night. Squits. They were due to siege Waterford but ended up puking up their rings after the quarry of bad pints. Bad pints. Disgusted with the carry-on, the Puritan general put out a warrant for Zack's arrest with a special amendment for torture and unusual pain of death. Ramsbottom demanded Zack to be put into a box filled with wood lice, then kicked down the Hill of Solace, located nine mile west of Mullingar, Past Loch Ool. Brezzy. If Zack had survived this mental ordeal, he would have been made into a mobile footrest for Cromwell himself. Futon. Bad consman. Bad consman. Cruel and unusual. Upon hearing a very tasty bounty was now on his head. Silly money. He sent his most trusted pint merchant, Simi O Salmon, off with the oxen convoy and its contents back up to his brothers in County Mayo. On Mayo. Then off he went by himself, walking to Dublin, disguised as Gary Neville. He needed to get right out of Dodge. Get out of town. Only way off the island was by boat. Obviously, they didn't have planes back then, so he went up to the Liffey and found a ship who'd take him. There was a gang of mad-looking pricks in funny top hats stopping off to do some shopping in Dublin before heading off across the wild Atlantic to America. He said, now I'm paraphrasing this, how are you fucking boys, hey? Where are you off to now, you mad gang of penis farts? He had indeed come across the puritanical Puritans headed for the new world. They were so boring that nobody wanted to hang out with them in Europe. They couldn't understand what Zack was talking about. So he was then met by the ship's captain, a Christopher Jones of Essex. Jose. Again, this isn't exactly verbatim, so you'll have to suspend your sense of disbelief. Oi, oi! I'm from fucking Essex, innit, mate? Towie! This moat is called the Mayflower. Yeah! What is heading across the big sea to America. That's right. And right up Ray Winston's spotty fucking arse. The promised land, innit? Promises, promises. These uptight fannies want to start again in the new world. Gimps. The passengers on this ship went to live in work in Holland. They thought it was pure shite. Yeah. They thought they was off to a luxury resort, but ended up working their bollocks off in a woolen mill. Woolen mill. Zack had heard about the new world. He could see a life of plenty flash before his eyes. A lad, Zack. He could make the prospect of exile work in his favour. You're heading down to Jamestown, are area. I heard nearly everyone died and it was shy crack. I make spirits, which help keep things nice and clean. Lovely spirits. I'm sure your surgeon would love that, lad man. I make lovely, smooth, nut-brown amber ales. Mm. You can drink this, brother man. Yes. A gorgeous bounty to behold. Ooh. Drink. After a long day of seafaring. I must have uh, oh, on any vessel. Drink. Essential. You give me the touch. Touch me. Come here. Get pissed. I'll go over with you. We'll have great old crack. Savage crack. We'll get on well. Captain Jones rubbed his chin and looked at the dour faces aboard the ship. Bastards. I mean, come on, Captain. 
Look at the state of these poor wankers, man. Losers. Have you ever seen such shams in need of a drop of the hard stuff? Not at all. All I need are grains, water, and a still. That's it. I'll turn any old shite into fine whiskey. You'll be made up I came with you. Oh, you'll be made up. You'll be there at the wheel, lushing it out oh, with a nice steady claw. Absolutely balubas. Fair dues to you, Paddy. We'll be happy to have you on board. Let's go. Oi, oi! Yeah, that is. Lad Bible. And with that, Zack hopped on board the Mayflower. And so began one of the most boring and terrifying ten weeks of his life. Cruel. He voyaged across the vast and furious ocean in autumn. Vast and furious. A time known for raging seas. Hurricane season was just starting to kick off. There was no turning back. He was bound for the new world. Sure, he managed to escape a bizarre and unusual fate at the hands of the general, what but nice. was also bored out of his unconsciousness. Fucking bored. So he started brewing a drop of drink aboard the ship. It was badly fucking needed. Oh, stop. The waves they encountered were over a hundred feet high. Cruel. The boat was left adrift for days on end. Smell of puke. With its sails drawn down to prevent the masts from collapsing. Cotton sheets. Men, women, and children huddled below Stinky. as the water poured in on top of them. Nerves shredded. The stink of the place, man. There was no turning back. Stuck. Fair play to Zack. He was on call to administer the Lushners on board to help steady the hand. Drink. And that he did with the power of Ishka Bahar. The water of life. The God's juice. Upon landing on what's now known as Cape Cod, a posh part of New England where hedge fund wankers and rich bastards live, Guns. Zach and his fellow passengers disembarked the Mayflower, kissing the ground and thanking God for the fortunate crossing. Despite the conditions faced by all aboard, only one life was lost. The surgeon's assistant. Pished up. A baby was born on board, which helped take the edge off. Nice. It was like a mortal tag team. Wow. With wow. one lad saying, Good luck, world. I'm checking out at the mortal coil. And a new soul coming in to fill the void saying, America, fuck yeah. Come and save the motherfucking world, yeah. Matt Damon. The Mayflower was originally bound for Virginia, but upon arriving in the new world, was forced to drop anchor in what was to be named Plymouth. When they disembarked the boat... They were horrified to find that the ground was totally frozen. Cultivating crops was impossible. They came hastily prepared without winter clothing, fishing rods and proper gear. Some foragers had found corn frozen under the snow, which at that point was regarded as a miracle. Without proper shelter and equipment, the crew and its passengers were forced to stay in cramped conditions on board, lockdown. reading by candlelight and getting absolutely steamboat willied on the sauce. Mm -hmm. It was better to drink sterile booze than chance potentially polluted water. Things that went from bad to worse after a mix of scurvy and pneumonia broke out on the ship. Fauci. Thanks to the lack of fresh food containing essential vitamins such as C and D. Get them into you. Scurvy's a bad old doing altogether. Condish. Symptoms include fever, fatigue, depression and bleeding gums causing teeth to fall out. The sweats. Meanwhile, pneumonia is a potentially life-threatening inflammatory condition that affects the lungs, causing fever, coughing, and pain. Oh, you're a doctor now, is it? 46 members of the expedition lost their lives, including half the crew. You could safely say it was bad old crack. Harsh dunes afoot. They had nothing on them but knee socks and suede winkle pickers with big old metal buckles hanging off them. Useless. Their gear would be frozen by the time they woke up in the morning. It was nearly as bad as the time myself and the boys went to sleep in the old lady's car up at the Rory Gallagher Festival in Ballyshannon. Almost as bad. We bought a tent up with us to kip in. A fool's errand. Upon landing in the lakeside campsite, we wondered what part of the five-inch deep waterlogged pitch we would set up in. The constant bands of rolling rain came in horizontally, all I bought was a denim jacket and a hoodie. Cool dude. After all was said and done, the passengers on board the Mayflyer hopped off in mid-March. A thaw began to melt the ice in the gentle March sun. She was still cold, so what? but stuck on a boat all winter with no privacy, Wi-Fi 
or Goodfellas Pizza to keep you going. Cool. Any bit of toil would have been a welcome change. We'll toil it up, man. After the township was eventually established, and Captain Jones decided the new world was shycrack compared to his home in Essex, he wished the Pilgrim Slags a fond de dieu before pegging it back with the remaining crew. He did it in five weeks, and the wife had the spuds on for him. He got back in no time to watch Deal or No Deal, a high-paced local phenomenon of watching lads haggle the local greengrocer for cabbage. He never did bother going back to America. He saw too much hardship, so he went down to the Canary Islands for an all-inclusive trip and purchased a shite load of luscious red wines. Ruby red. I can imagine him there, sipping away on a sunny beach, looking over the warm sunset. He must have been thinking about that pissed-up Irish lad who hopped on board with his putcheen. A man, Zach. They didn't have phones or Facebook back then in those days, so they just had to make up a fake image of them in their mind's eye. What happened to Zach McDonald in the end? Fuck knows, man. I just made the whole thing up. And if you were listening in school, then you would have well remembered Cromwell's reign of terror kicked off around 1641. Nice save. And the feckin' the Mayflower, like, you know, that got there like 1620, so... Did it, yeah. You know yourself. But it did make for a nice bit of filler. Am I right in the wrong? Plenty of filler. You be the judge of that. Hey, sure is more informative than most of the shite you'd see on RTE these days. RTE. Sure, factually speaking... Mel Gibson's Braveheart was all over the shop. Brave job. Winning a heap of Oscars and turned Brendan Gleeson into a Hollywood big shot. Brendan Gleeson. Tell you something. Princess Isabella, played by Sophia Marceau, was fucking nice, hey? Oh, yeah. Imagine being in the cop beside her after a rowdy Saturday night. Now you're talking. Tender shifting in the heat of the noon. Class. As Buzz McDonald would say, women are fucking class, man. And thus ends Hardy Book Part 6. This is me, Eddie Durkin, signing off. And if you like what you hear, please head over to Hardy Book's Patreon if you want to throw a few quid to the main man. If you want to do a one-time donation, PayPal forward slash Maloney's Digest. And come here, hey, like this, share it, and subscribe. And I'll tell you something else, hey. The word of mouth is the best job, yeah? So tell at least 15 people on your social media or in real life or just randomers you meet on the bus and just say like, oh, let's listen to the Hardy book there, part six, man. Oh, 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 oh. Last man. Anyway, thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Next part will be up, hopefully in two weeks. <coughs> <coughs> Fucking voice. <coughs> Good luck.